you know, add it to the list. I went to the dentist the other day and they're like, oh, you, you know, if you don't floss, you're going to develop gum disease. I'm like, another thing to worry about. Hooray. <laughs> so it's just one of those things that you have to look at with the lens of humor. And, you know, that's the only way to get through. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast, brought to you by A Advanced Services and Fuse Networks. My name's Galen. I'm Joe. We're coming at you from the Creative Block Studios in Seattle, Washington. So, Joe, for our new listeners and viewers tuning in for the first time, how do we start this journey? Sure. We started out at a, as a private Facebook group page where the purpose was to bring business owners together to kind of just communicate with one another and kind of help each other grow their businesses. Uh, because we're a marketing company and we get a lot of questions asked to us outside of just marketing, we thought what a better way than to start a podcast and to bring on different guests um, to share their thoughts about different topics uh, so that they can help businesses with their business and entrepreneurial journeys. Awesome. And today's guest is Amanda Hill, joining us all the way from Texas. And today's Yay. topic is being <laughs> bold in business. So she'll share her insight shortly. But before she does, Amanda, please introduce yourself to our audience. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This is so thrilling. I love marketing so much. So my name is Amanda and I'm a lawyer. I'm a health lawyer, so I only represent physicians and healthcare groups. And I love it. I've been doing it for 23 years and everything was rocking along until a couple of years ago in the middle of COVID when I decided to branch out and start my new entrepreneurial journey. So it's been a fun ride and I'd love to talk about it, but it's really been an adventure going from practicing law to starting a product based nationwide company <laughs> and the journey that has ensued. So it's been a real fun time and I'm really lucky to be able to have my foot in both worlds to still have my profession and still have this new entity and still do all the creative stuff that I love. So it's, it's really fun to talk about. So what got you into the, the health side of your journey? Interestingly, as most people, it's sort of something I fell into, right? Because I, I had to move to this little town of Waco, Texas, which no one's heard of. And now <laughs> Chip and Joanna Gaines moved there and everyone knows who, right? where Waco, Texas is. It's the is. center of the Magnolia universe, right? Yes, so. <laughs> the silos have reigned supreme. Speaking of great marketing, in any event, I moved to Waco, Texas and had to get a job because my husband at the time was going to law school at that university, Baylor University. So I mm -hmm. found the first job I could. And honestly, it's kind of a, it's a metaphor for my future because there was a job interview for a 10 year lawyer, meaning you had to have 10 years experience before you can get the job. And I thought, Psh, I can get that. So I enter, you know, I applied for this job that I was way underqualified for. I was fresh spring chicken right out of school. And I think they just took pity on me and they interviewed me just because they thought, well, what kind of husband does this woman have to interview for this experienced job? I think I still had paint on my hands from moving into a new house and I interviewed and they, you know, somehow took a risk on me. I'm very grateful and hired me on the spot as an entry level lawyer. And that was at the department of veterans affairs. Mm -hmm. And so I started representing VA hospitals right out the shoot. And it was the most magical thing that I couldn't believe they trusted me with, <laughs> with such a big responsibility. But uh, I really fell in love at that point with working with doctors. And I realized that, you know, they need a voice. Doctors need to have a spokesman mm -hmm. to represent them well. And so, man, that started a whole career in the healthcare sector, which I never knew, you know, I would ever do. So it's happenstance. All right. So, um, on this wild entrepreneurial journey that you've been on or continue to go on, what are some early lessons learned as an entrepreneur? Whew. Well, I think the biggest lesson for me is, you know, you can consider your career trajectory, a bunch of false starts, mm -hmm. or you can consider them all steps, you know, to the next thing. I can tell you that in my journey, in my career, it's taken a lot of twists and turns. You know, it was not a linear path. I was on a tele nationwide television show um, on NBC. I thought that was going to be my path. Then I decided to quit practicing law and write a couple of books. Thought that was my path. You know, every time I would sort of pivot and try to do this creative thing, and then I would get lead, you know, lead myself back to center. 
But every one of these was a journey, you know, for me mm -hmm. to take. It was a leap. It was a growth point. It got me to the next thing. So instead of saying, man, I've taken a lot of false starts, a lot of my colleagues and professionals say, well, that failed and this failed and this company failed. It's like, no, 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 none of them failed. You know, they might not have made money, but they taught you extremely valuable lessons for the next project, mm -hmm. for the next thing, for the next company. So I find that probably the biggest early lesson for me is, wow, this doesn't have to be failure. You know, it could be learning because man, I, there was a couple of moments in there. I thought I have truly failed. <laughs> you know? yeah. Now I'm very successful and it all worked out. And I look back and I use the examples from those failures all the time, you know, like, well, let me tell you how I fell on my face there. And let me tell you how I wildly messed up right there. And then, you know, it's, it's a joke and it's humor, but it also helps you grow and develop mm -hmm. a thick skin and resilience. And all that's crucial when you start your own company. Being that you've grown your businesses and you've failed and you've, I would use those as stepping stones, fail forward, I'd like to say, what's the best piece of advice that you've been given? Okay, y'all are gonna laugh at this, no pun intended, but you have to find humor in these situations you know mm -hmm. i think that it's so tempting to sort of victimize yourself and say you know well the deck was stacked against me and i can't believe that i couldn't get this where and everybody else is doing it not me you know victim 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 instead you just sort of have to learn to laugh about some of the failures i think you know some of those stepping stones it's like that was pretty hilarious that I thought I was going to be the greatest American novelist and determined that I would go straight to the top or that was pretty <laughs> ridiculous of me to think that I, you know, that I could do this. And yet, you know, through that humor, um, you sort of, I like to say, develop power over your circumstances. You know, you look at things differently from different angles. You can laugh about your journey and I think it normalizes it for other people, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, she's not devastated about all these things that she tried that didn't work out. I tell people all the time for every successful thing I've done, there was five things that probably didn't work. <laughs> you know, it's like, if anything, mm -hmm. I'm ambitious. So I think that that's what the biggest advice is you let, you have to learn to laugh when things do not work out. And sometimes they do and you ride that wave when you can, you know, and sometimes they don't and you laugh at yourself. So I mm -hmm. think humor is a big coping skill for me, especially in the hard times when, you know, it's almost like what else mm -hmm. can go wrong? You know, add it to the list. I went to the dentist the other day and they're like, oh, you, you know, if you don't floss, you're going to develop gum disease. I'm like, another thing to worry about. Hooray. <laughs> so it's just one of those things that you have to look at with the lens of humor. And, you know, that's the only way to get through. Awesome. I know we had two seasons of that rom-com called the COVID pandemic, right? <laughs> so <laughs> right, exactly. you had to go help you that and find the best thing out of that. All right. Moving forward, since this is a marketing podcast, why is marketing important? You mentioned that you're, you love marketing. We're marketing nerds. So we always love asking this question to our guests. Well, I have a background in public relations. So I took a ton of marketing as well in the mass comm department when I was back in the day. I adore storytelling. And part of, you know, part of public relations, part of marketing is storytelling. And it's sort of telling a story about your product because mm -hmm. it's such a crowded world. It really is. And there's so much AI and there's so much fake, you know, static noise out there that one thing I find just remarkable about good marketing is that it rises above that noise and it tells a story. And so when I see good marketing copy, I'm always, you know, like you nerding out about it. Cause I'm like, wow, what a great storyteller, you know, Donald Miller, he's a huge, you know, storytelling brand, you know, type mm -hmm. marketer. But I found that the marketing that works the best is quick, punchy, unique, and storytelling. And so I try to follow a lot of the storytelling mindset because if you're out there in the world, you know, looking at the millions of products and it's all so overwhelming, don't you wanna read someone's stuff that's interesting? Don't you wanna be drawn in with the hero's journey? You know, don't you wanna see yourself in that story? So I, I definitely think that one of the most important things about amazing marketing is taking a, a thing, a widget, a product, a service, and making it tell an amazing story in the world. You know, where does it fit in the world? What purpose does this thing serve you know, that the other things don't? How is this elevated in such a way that makes it intriguing to people? Th to me, that's magic. It's truly magic. Awesome. 
Uh, so now we come to our part of our podcast, our Fuse Network's Did You Know segment. Millions of cyber criminals are out there on a daily basis trying to steal your information. It's not a matter of if, it's when. Small businesses account for 58% of cyber attacks annually. So help your company fight cybercrime and mitigate risk by being proactive. Call Fuse Networks, your local Seattle IT experts at 206-701-6040 for a complimentary IT network and security assessment. There's a couple myths I want to read to Amanda, then get your feedback on um, for our topic, being bold in business. So this first myth I'll read, or Joe, do you mind reading this first one, please? Only startup companies make bold business decisions. I don't know about that. I think any company can make a bold business decision. So I don't know if I agree with that. I think that the key is making smart, strategic decisions. I don't care if you're a startup. You don't want to act foolishly when you're a startup and you don't want to act foolishly when you have people that depend on you, right? So I don't think mm-hmm. it matters the size of the company. I've seen large companies take very bold acts. In there. Sometimes you're like, mm-hmm. did you strategize that? Did you think about that? And so I don't think it matters the size. I think though, the bigger you get, the more you start to worry that this is going to have a negative effect on your staff and your team. Mm-hmm. And so I think sometimes it diminishes you know, the ability to make really huge, bold decisions, but not always, because I've seen some really big companies make bold calls. Awesome. So this next one, businesses who act boldly always act with speed. So talk to us about that myth. Okay, so you have to be real careful with speed. I'm like the speed demon, okay? And when someone asks me to do something, I'm like, you'll have it by 2 (laughs) p.m. Like, I am fast. And I actually have to check myself because that is not always the best attitude. In fact, it usually results in you missing something or you regretting Mm -hmm. it later. So I think being bold means being smart. Being bold means you think about the outcome and how you're gonna get there. Now, you you can't sit too long in this market. You certainly have to keep up with the trends, but I Mm -hmm. think if you go too quickly, you're gonna gonna make a real big mistake. And I've been there. I shot off a proposal in a day when I thought someone was interested in the product and I look back and regret it. Like, mm, that was too fast. I did not think that through. I overpromised. I did not charge enough. You know, all these mistakes you make because you didn't think about it. You didn't sit mm-hmm. through. And you know, I, you, my husband is great with this stuff. So sometimes we strategize, you know, he started many companies. So, you know, what do you think about this? It takes the time to mull it over, you know, let it stir, you know, let it stir for a little bit in your head and then go act. Awesome. The last last one one, then, being bold means doing it by yourself. Oh, dear. Well, no, that's a myth. I don't think you can do anything by yourself except for the dream and the idea. And that's certainly a a solo act oftentimes. I I have said so many times that, you know, building a business is involves a community. It really has to, Mm -hmm. right? It's not just about hiring a marketing team. It's about having a community around you to support you, to help you with different parts of it that you're not good at, you know, to help speak truth to you and maybe you're going in the wrong direction. A team around you to say even things like, can you look at my sales funnels? What am I doing wrong? You know, how am I going in this direction and not getting anywhere? How do I redirect? But here's the deal. Some people that I know that start companies are so stubborn that they won't listen to any help. And I think that's the real Mm -hmm. player. You know, yes, a lot of startups happen with a lot of our own you know, blood, sweat, tears, we bankroll it ourselves. You know, a lot of it is you, Mm -hmm. you're in charge for sure. The buck stops here. But if you can't listen to feedback and learn and grow from those people that are really smart around you, I don't think you're going to get there because not one person solo can do all the things it takes to run a business and market a business. I just think it takes a team. Mm -hmm. All right. So when we talk about being bold in business, you know, a lot of our audience is probably um, they've run their businesses, you know, to differing degrees of success or maybe sometimes even failure. So when these businesses look at themselves and they reassess, especially coming out of the COVID pandemic, you know, like being bold or being more aggressive, um, what does that mean to someone who who hasn't done it yet, who maybe wants to take a first step? What, what insight could you provide fellow business owners when you think of that bold mindset in terms of your business? I think the one thing I guess I've learned and hopefully it'll help others is it's one thing to have an idea. We're just so full of ideas, right? There's a lot of problems to solve in the universe, 
But you have to niche down and figure out, you know, what specific problem are you solving for and you go solve it. And you try to explain to the world that this specific problem is, you know, is perfect for you to help them fix. And I think that too many people try to get bold and they just jump too far and too wide, right? right? Their product, their services is all over the map. Nobody quite understands what they do. You know, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to promote joy. I'm going to sell happiness. It's like, no, no, you're going to help someone lose weight in two weeks that needs a menu. <laughs> you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You need to have specific goals. And sometimes I feel when you're speaking of being bold, that people think that means huge, not mm -hmm. necessarily. Right. It means tailoring it to specifically the audience that you're looking for, that ideal customer avatar or whatever marketers call it. You know, you're trying to market to that person. You're selling a solution to their problem. So actually it's kind of small. So think it, you think bold ideas and then you sort of niche down to try to say, this is the person that I'm trying to sell to. And I'm not trying to sell to everybody else. And I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but this is my perfect customer. And then you go nail it. And I think the another part of being bold is knowing when to sell versus knowing when to like get your name out there and like, you right. know, we're going to generally market ourselves and we want ourselves to be known in the world. It's like, no, go sell, <laughs> you know, because somebody's going to have to pay that bill. You know, somebody's got to pay the debts. You got to sell. And so I think that's really hard. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to just generally put your name into the world and think people are going to come to you. They don't. The world's right. too big. There's too much to sell. So you have to be real targeted about it. So I guess my piece of advice is like, man, think big, but niche down. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you think, how are people failing in being bold? I don't think they get that lesson. Um, I was talking to a, a person the other day, just starting a brand new company, doing life coaching. And I said, oh, great. Tell me about who you're marketing to. Who are you doing life coaching for? She's like, women. I was like, well, there's a lot of women in the world. So tell me specifically <laughs> why. And she said, well, I want women to live bigger, brighter, more joyful lives. I was like, don't we all? You know, like that's every woman. You know, I don't know. What, what are you selling? You know, that's what I mean about I love her energy and I love that she's starting this. But also I couldn't quite figure out, you know, what she, who she was selling to and what she yeah. was doing. So, right. so I think there's a big step between taking the leap to start a company, right? It's you start an LLC, you know, you file your paperwork, you get your business cards, you know, that's in and of itself a big step from nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then you go there and then you go, okay, I'm, here's my idea. And that's kind of bold and you might be excited about it. But then taking the failure is the next step, which is how do mm -hmm. I take all these amazing ideas and tailor it to a specific audience that will buy my specific thing. So in my opinion, and I'm not great about it too. I mean, I'm telling you things that I am learning as I go, right? I started out saying, I'm gonna sell training videos to doctors. I mean, how broad can you get? You know, <laughs> So it's definitely <laughs> been an adventure. But the reason I've learned it is because I've made those mistakes and I'm still learning. Awesome. Um, so when you see when businesses try to, when they make steps, they, they have the idea and they're cultivating the idea. Um, when, what's a good exercise for them to pare down like, all right, this is the big idea. I want to change the world. And then you just from the example you gave, like, I want to help women, but like, which women? Um, is there something that they could do that like an exercise or is it taking a test or writing the pros and cons just to just the paring it down. Cause I, I think I've, I've talked to enough business owners where they have, everyone wants to be the best at what they do, whatever, sell a widget, provide a service. Right. And the end of the day, sometimes the execution fails and they're still where they are, but people could be listening to this episode. Same thing. Like I tried this three years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, but I'm still where I am. This big idea hasn't left cause it's in your tickler file in your brain. What's the way to get that out, refine it? Is there something you see when, when you work with um, like clients or people in this kind of stage? Um, what are ways that they could kind of refine that down? Well, let me tell you what worked for me. Asking my customers, that's what works, right? Because mm -hmm. if you go to your customers and you say, hey, why aren't you, you, know, why aren't you buying this product? What's going on? What are you missing? And you're gonna hear all this, you know, sometimes they don't wanna be rude to you, right? Especially if they're like, oh, I don't wanna mm -hmm. tell you the truth. But if you're like, look, I'm asking for honest feedback, do not hold back. If you go to customers and clients and say, what are you missing? Then oftentimes they'll tell you to your face. If you can mm -hmm. be bold you know, enough and, and absorb that information, 
If you said, why aren't you buying my product? And they go, because I don't really understand it. Well, you know what? That's on you as a, as a yeah. company. You're not explaining it well. You know, if they say, well, I don't want it because it's too expensive, that may or may not be true. You need more data. You know, maybe if everybody says that, then you might mm -hmm. listen to that. It's just really important to be tuned in to what feedback you're hearing, you know? And a lot of times if I explain my product, for example, and a doctor goes, I don't really, what, what is it that you do again? Problem, right? That's a problem. Like I didn't explain that well. So I think that it's really important to be open-minded to listening to the people that your audience, you're trying to sell to, and they're not getting it. I always go, well, that must be a my fault situation, right? If I'm not mm -hmm. explaining it so clearly, so easily that they pick it up right then, then I need to be better about explaining it. I need to shorten it. I need to tighten it. You know, and the only way you know that is by listening to people that are, you know, in your market, not your best friend, right? Not the person down the street that doesn't know your industry, your customers. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the most gold I've received is when cut and I will ask for honest feedback and they give it to me and I'm so grateful. And it's sometimes positive and it's sometimes negative. Actually, the negative is much more helpful because, you know, I don't want to hear like, it's amazing. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, then why aren't you buying it? <laughs> There must be something missing here. Yeah. I did not convince you well <laughs> enough. So um, I really suggest that people be more open-minded. I have, a, I'm in a lot of masterminds and I have a lot of people that own small companies and, and a lot of times they'll say that, well, my customers are telling me this, but I don't think that's true. I'm like, you should probably listen to the people you're selling to. I mean, that's probably what, you know, is really important to hear. So you just have to be, you know, you have to take that ego. I'll tell you the one thing I've learned, there ain't no room for ego when you start a company. You got to get it all the way to the floor. You're no one special. You're mm -hmm. a, just a startup like everybody else. And I think that is hard, you know, because I went from being a lawyer, which has a lot of prestige and a lot of, you know, I have a great reputation. I have this great, you know, network. Everybody kind of knew who I was. And then all of a sudden a startup, it's like, I'm, I'm down to nothing. You know, I'm starting to, this is a, is a big world out there. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really, right. it's a really good teaching moment for me. It's like, I'm just starting out like everybody else. Nice. You mentioned something in the beginning about an NBC. What series were you on? I was on The Apprentice, which is a reality show. Um, it was with oh, Martha yeah. Stewart. Yeah. She. Speaking of marketing, I I love Martha Stewart because I'm very domestic. I cook, I bake, I decorate, I garden. I had chickens, like all these things. And uh, I thought I would just quit my law job and go live in New York and work for Martha Stewart. So anyway, it was really fun. I didn't, you know, turns out that wasn't my future. But it was a really cool adventure and I don't regret it. And it was sort of fun because it springboarded me into bold thinking since we're on the topic. You know, you don't go quit your job and, you know, go on a reality show unless you're a tiny bit bold. <laughs> so I thought it was a really good exercise. Right, right. Just, you know what? Go try something hard that's out of your comfort zone. Go step into this world that maybe you were on the edge of. And I'll tell you, at the mm -hmm. end of that show, I got an interview with Liz Claiborne, which is a huge, you know, company, women's mm -hmm. clothing. And I was, mm -hmm. I thought I was ready to, you know, pivot in my career at that point. I wanted to go back to public relations. I really loved the fashion world. I thought it'd be really exciting. And then I got pregnant. That's how life goes, right? I got pregnant and I decided I didn't want to raise a child in New York City. I didn't want to have to transfer, you know, my husband's bar, you know, all these things. And I was like, forget it. We're just going to go, <laughs> just going to go back home and be lawyers. And, uh, <laughs> took a different path, but again, not a mistake, you know, a pivot and took, didn't take that path. Didn't want to go to New York, decided to stay in Texas. And I'm really happy that I did that. And so everything you look back on and you're like, well, there was a reason for that. Or if there wasn't, I made a reason out of it and you just move forward. That's so interesting. So how, I mean, just a side question. So like, how's that, how do you as an attorney get cast into, how does that connect, you know, finding it to the apprentice from where you're at in Texas and they, they uh, comb the nation for different people. How, how do you get connected to that opportunity? That's a great question. So they had an open casting call in Fort Worth, Texas at the time. And I was staying with a friend in Fort Worth that weekend. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a casting call for this cool show with Martha Stewart. I want to go. There was like a million people across this nation that applied for the show. I have no idea how I stood out, but they, they, they were looking for, you know, certain people that sit, fit certain molds and I guess I fit a mold. Um, so I, you know, they funnel us in 10 by 10. They ask us dumb questions. They somehow pick people out and then you just keep going round by round. They kept whittling it down. I kept going, Oh wow. I got it to the next round. Somehow I made it on the show. There was like 16 of us, I think total. 
And it was, you know, I have no idea what they were looking for and why they wanted a tall blonde lawyer, you know, a mouthy lawyer to go up there and live in New York. And, and when I got tired, I'd get kind of twangy, you know, it just happens. I'm sorry, y'all. And I thought it was really a fun adventure. And maybe they were looking for, you know, a smart, stubborn Southern girl. Maybe that's the mold that I fit, whatever it was, I went and it was so fun. I met so many friends and the adventures that we had, you know, you really can't replicate anywhere else, you yeah. know, like, oh yeah, we sold, you know, wedding cakes on, you know, at a Fifth Avenue boutique and we renovated a place on Times Square and we, you know, all these cool tasks that are ridiculous, right? They're not real. <laughs> but speaking of marketing, a lot of the things that Martha's mm -hmm. Deliver Living Omnimedia does is marketing related. So that was really where I, I really enjoyed. So a lot mm -hmm. of the marketing tasks were fun. So it was great. I don't regret it. And I don't regret going back to law where my true passion lies. I thought a couple of times that I would steer, steer away from it, but just like a, you know, the life's purpose does, it just keeps bringing you back to where you need to be. And that's where I ended. And now I can see all these roads converging, you know, the marketing experience, the mm -hmm. creativity, the writing, all the stuff I've done, even mothering, you know, has sort of led to this moment. And I, I feel like this is it. This is the culmination of everything I've ever worked for. It just makes me want to tear up. You know, it's like, I can't believe I got here. I can, this is so great. Mm -hmm. I wish everyone could find this sort of purpose, you know, to take what you're trained in and to take what you love and sort of merge them together. It doesn't have to be either or. And I think that's important for right. you to hear. You know, you don't have to give up everything that you've worked for. You know, if you're a thoracic surgeon, you don't have to drop it all to be a novelist. You, know, you, you can write about it. You can talk about it. You can use all your skills in that new way. And that's what's so beautiful is just putting it all together. So with uh, your business, Guard My Practice, with the, are there, what kind of doctors do you work with? Uh, who are ideal clients for your business there? So... One of the programs that we have is called 90 Day Notice, and it's really working with doctors that lose their jobs and they're transitioning to a new job. That's sort of our biggest program. And it's really cool because I teach it with a physician surgeon coach. She's a professional coach, but she's a surgeon. So together we talk about letting go of the past, renegotiating a new contract, you know, learning what it's like to build leverage and how to negotiate and what kind of job you're looking for. Because what I found in all sectors, not just medicine, is that people quit a job and then they go look for another one. Like they're looking for a menu of jobs and then they just pick one yeah, and they right. interview and they hope they get it. You know, instead of being like, wait a minute, what job fits me? You know, what fits my personality? What can, how can I make a difference? You know, how can I take my skills and make this place better? So we sort of reinvent the way they think about job transitions. It's fun. I love teaching that. And then I have a lot of online courses for physicians, a lot of them starting out where they don't know how to negotiate their contracts. They're worried about getting in trouble. They don't know how to deal with employees and their practice. So I have little, you know, courses on all those things. Mm -hmm. And it's really been rewarding. You know, when a, when a doctor signs up for one of my courses and takes it and says, Oh my gosh, I feel like I can actually negotiate now, or I know how to deal with these employment issues and difficult patients. And I never really understood it before. And it, you put it in such layman's terms. It's like, Yay, I did my job. Mm -hmm. So that's fun. I really <laughs> I like that part. That's awesome. So for uh, doctors out there who um, want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to contact you? Go to my website, guardmypractice.com. Um, you can also go to my, I also am a lawyer still, remember? So in Texas, you can go to Hill Health Law, that's my law firm, and just shoot me a note on the contact page. You know, also, I really love LinkedIn. That's my new favorite thing. I started posting there a lot a couple months ago and I was like, well, they're my people all over the place. So if you find me on LinkedIn, I love it because we communicate and it's a real new uh, adventure for me. I've always thought of LinkedIn as just where you post your, you know, where you got a job and everybody puts their accolades and it's sort of like a walking CV. But I've really learned that it's, it is more of a social site and you can share professional articles and you can really talk amongst each other. So find me there. And let's chat, you know, let's have conversations. That's what I love the most is just raising issues, developing this interesting, diverse community where we can talk to each other. You know, we're not just selling awesome. to each other. We're actually engaging, which is super cool. Um, one more time, Amanda, can you list all your uh, contact information on how people could uh, reach you? We just need to re-record that piece. Yes. So you can reach me on my website, guardmypractice.com. 
Or if you want to reach me as a lawyer, you can go to my legal website, which is hillhealthlaw.com. That's a mouthful. And find me on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. It's so engaging. I've really discovered a community of physicians there that I really like talking with. I find it very collegial. You know, it's less, it's less TikTok-y. It's less, you know, silly. It's more professional. And you can post articles and discourse with each other and really have open-minded thinking. And a lot of people, you know, I don't agree with. And I love to comment on their posts. And we go back and forth. And it's, it's become more civil debate. And I really enjoy it. So find me there on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. So on behalf of our sponsors, A Advanced Services and Fees Networks, my name's Galen. I'm Joe. Coming at you from the Creative Block Studios in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Amanda, thanks for joining us on our episode today. We loved having you on, sharing your insight. Um, and everyone, uh, yeah, tune in. So thanks, everyone, for watching this episode of the Ask for Outmaster Finance Podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.